Oh my, owe you a smoothie. <laughs> it's the flowers. All right. <laughs> so I'll plan to talk about these things, not in, in any particular order, but in, in kind of a clinically informative, useful way when you're dealing with a thoracentesis or a pleural effusion patient. Um, pathophysiology, of course, is important for any of the basic talks. How to detect a pleural effusion, what to do when you see it, what to look for when you see it, how to sample it, and what kind of testing to send for what purpose of diagnosis. And then we'll sprinkle in treatment in the middle. So there are 105 million cases of pleural effusions every year. So if you divide that by the number of days of the, of the year and the number of states, there are 80 people presenting every day to any hospital in, in Ohio with, with a pleural effusion. And the causes of those pleural effusions can be because of something that's in the chest, uh, a, a heart failure, high pressure pulmonary edema, low pressure pulmonary edema, pneumonia, cancer, uh, maybe something in the abdomen, uh, like an abdominal abscess, uh, causing irritation of the diaphragm, abdominal mass, ascites that can translocate into the thorax, or diseases that are systemic, that cause systemic inflammation, uh, like rheumatoid arthritis and, and, and uh, yellow nail syndrome. No matter how rare it is, you're going to see it on your test. The body makes about 7 to 14 cc's of pleural fluid every day for both lungs. That's not much. The body also removes a similar amount every day. So you'll end up with about 5 cc's in, on every side, on each side, of pleural effusion, no more than that. And the system is imbalanced. Most of the cells that are in the pleural effusion are macrophages and mesothelial cells. Uh, you're not supposed to see granulocytes. You're not supposed to see lymphocytes or inflammatory cells. And the pH of the fluid in the pleural space is not equal to the blood. It's actually higher than the pH of the blood. It's about 7.6. So even though 7.4 pH of a pleural effusion is considered normal, it's not what you usually have. The pleura that makes the pleural fluid is the parietal pleura. And the pleura that removes the pleural fluid is also the parietal pleura. And the way it works is that the, the, inter, uh, the intercostal vessels, inter, intercostal arteries and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and um, uh, vessels in general, uh, they, they, they have higher pressure than the pleural pressure. So there is a gradient of the pleural capillary and the pleural artery uh, for the fluid to translocate into the interstitium. The distance of the intercostal vessels and capillaries to the, to the parietal pleural surface is smaller, is narrower than the distance between the visceral pleura and the pulmonary capillaries and the bronchial arteries. So the fluid that seeps out of the pulmonary uh, capillary or the bronchial uh, arteries stay in the, in the interstitium for a while and then they get reabsorbed into the interstitial lymphatics and they go away. They never spill into the pleural, into the pleural space. But parietal pleura, in the parietal pleura, some of the fluid doesn't get reabsorbed into the lymphatics and the venules, but spills into the pleural space. And that's very important because diseases that affect the generation of pleural fluid increase the generation of pleural fluid, usually aren't pleural diseases. They're usually lung diseases. And disturbance of this balance on the visceral side is what causes most of the pleural effusions to happen. So think of someone with, with interstitial um, uh, pneumonitis or someone with CHF. They're going to have a higher pulmonary capillary pressure, a little bit, but they're going to have higher lymphatic pressure and venous pressure in the lungs. And that will occlude this system from working. This will stop fluid from going from the interstitium and be reabsorbed. So it's going to spill into the pleural surface backwards 
It's not supposed to do that. The pleural pressure is usually low. It's in the minus on average, but it ranges between minus nine and plus three. And the interstitial pressure on the, on the parietal side, that's the side closer to the chest wall, is a little bit higher. So fluid tends to move this way. Pleural fluid, after it sits in the pleural space, gets resorbed through the lymphatics of the parietal pleura. It doesn't go into the pulmonary uh, side, into the lung side, into the visceral side usually. Some of the fluid can go that way, but the majority of the removal happens through the lymphatics. So a disease that occludes lymphatics, like yellow nail syndrome, or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or using some drugs, can actually make this fluid build up. Not because there is increased production, but because there is decreased resorption. So the fluid that comes out into the pleural space normally is an ultrafiltrate. And the mechanisms of formation of this ultrafiltrate can either be stuff that you already know, increased pressure, hydrostatic pressure, decreased oncotic pressure, such as in liver disease, kidney disease, and increased hydrostatic pressure either overload, um, a transfusion uh, with taco, uh, CHF, diastolic heart failure, or pleural pressure problem. So that's when the lung, for example, collapses for some reason or the other. There might be pleural disease that pulls the lung away from the chest wall, or there could be an occlusion of the bronchus that causes collapse of the, of the parenchyma, and that creates a vacuum in the pleural space, more negative than usual. So the fluid moves into the pleural space, but finds it difficult to move out of the pleural space. Endothelial permeability can increase, such as in pneumonia or in ARDS, and that makes fluid go into the pleural space with its protein, so it's harder for it to come back and be, get reabsorbed. And lymphatic drainage problems, such as in malignancy, that occludes lymphatics. But the disease doesn't have to be in the chest, like, like you heard. It could be from the peritoneum. Hydro, um, hydrothorax, because of liver disease, can translocate into the, into the pleural surface because the pleural pressure is lower than the abdominal pressure. So it can suck the fluid up through holes in the diaphragm that we normally have. It could come from a thoracic duct rupture. So a lymphoma can occlude the lymphatics but can also damage the, um, the lymphatics that drain into the... Uh, into the, into the main channels, such as the thoracic duct on the left side. Or it could be atrogenic. You can cause this by injuring an artery or injuring vein or, or migrating a catheter into the pleural space and then putting all of the tube feed or the infusions that you're giving the patient into the pleural space. That's something that, that's not directly because of pleural damage. The evaluation is tricky. Of course, 80% of the evaluation of the diagnosis comes from history. But the problem is you might never find the pleural fluid through the history. You might find it after you've obtained the history and the exam and the imaging. And what makes sense at that point is to go back to the patient. Don't, don't shy away from going back to the room and asking the patient about what drugs have they taken, what kind of exposures they've had in their life. Have they been exposed to asbestos? Have they had that chest pain that they described for longer than a certain period of time? Have they had trauma? Look with your exam at the chest and then definitely examine the area under the diaphragm carefully to see, is there something causing this effusion to happen? You might also ask about synthesis of protein, hemodynamics, other inflammatory disorders, examine the joints, and look for causes for low drainage. You might never know. You can find the yellow nail syndrome one day. For an x-ray to show you a pleural effusion on an upfront uh, lateral x-ray, upright lateral x-ray, you need more than 75 cc's for the fluid to completely fill up the subpulmonic area and spill into the sulcus that sits posteriorly. And you will need more than 175 cc's to fill up the costal margins, the lateral costal margins. 
A chest CT, an ultrasound, and a decubitus X-ray are more sensitive. You can detect less fluid with those modalities. Last time I ordered a lateral decubitus X-ray was a couple of years ago, and it does work, except most of the time when you get it, the patient is laying on the bed, and the picture of the bed comes in view rather than the layering fluid that comes in view. So you have to make sure to have this X-ray done in radiology on a hard bed, not on the usual soft bed. The CAT scan, of course, is more sensitive, and it's not only going to show you the pleura, but it's going to show you the underlying lung. Pleural ultrasound will show you not only the pleural fluid, but the characteristics of the pleural space. And it's even more sensitive than a CT in looking for loculations and inceptations. A recumbent, flu a recumbent x ray will only show you fluid if it's more than 500 cc's. An area that we don't look at is the apical caps. If the apical caps are thick in a, in a, in a, in a supine patient, get another x ray with an upright. And if that apical cap goes away, that could be your sign of a pleural effusion that, that moved up when the patient was supine. So again, you will lose this angle after having more than 175 cc's. So that's a good amount of fluid. You can tap it. And you're going to get this layering and a distance from the chest wall to the top of the layering of fluid can, can estimate the size of the effusion. If it's more than uh, a centimeter and a half, then it's probably more than 200 cc's and it can be tapped easily. One and a half centimeters. So the CAT scan will tell you about the parenchyma, will tell you about the lung itself, the pleural thickness, if there is pleural thickening. For that, you need contrast. You won't see the pleural lines without contrast. It'll also tell you about the location of the fluid, if it's intraparenchymal or extraparenchymal, differentiating an abscess from, a, from pleural effusion. And it will also tell you about the area under the diaphragm. So those are some good advantages. And you can use Hounsfield units to tell you if this is fluid or soft tissue, or if it's compressed lung, or if it's an open lung. By, by convention, the Hounsfield units are zero at water, minus 1,000 for air, and minus 1,000 for bone. That's how it's standardized. Your PAX viewer on the floor is not going to give you that information. But if you go to radiology and you say, I want to look at the Hansfield units of this area, I want to know, is this a transidate or an exudate? What do you think the answer will be? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Most of the time, you can't. At least there was one study that looked, like at 100, looked at 100 CTs that were known to be either an exudate or a transudate. And 78% 78 of them were exudates and 22 were transudates. And the presence of loculations, presence of a thick pleural surface, or nodules on the pleural surface was not useful in differentiating the two. And the house Hounds field units, as you can see, cannot differentiate really. It's between 7 and 10. But because I'm an ultrasound guy, um, I can surely tell you that an ultrasound is no better than a CT in differentiating transudates from exudates. But we still use it. Um, proteinaceous material in the pleural space can make the pleural, look, the pleural fluid look thick. The presence of septations can be easily detected without contrast. You don't have to transport the patient. You can use the machine to guide your access point, and it can help you avoid some pitfalls in the procedure. But still, it cannot differentiate between transudate and exudate. So you still have to sample the fluid. This is a picture of an echo-free space. Don't be fooled by the area behind ribs, which is this point and this point. These areas might look dark, even though there might not be fluid. But in this picture, specifically, there is a lot of echo-free space. The diaphragm 
as an area that you should not go below. And once you see air, it's going to look like white storm, and you should not go up to that point either. So another example here, you have liver in the, on, the le on the right side of the screen. The head of the patient is on the left side of the screen. Echo-free space, which is pleural effusion. This is the edge of the lung that's already compressed and floating in the fluid. And this is the point where you probably put the needle in. You can use either a curvilinear probe, which is the abdominal probe, or you can use a cardiac probe, just called the sector array. Both of those should be set at a frequency of between 2 and 5 megahertz. Most of the time, you're just going to grab the probe and put it on the patient. And if you see the fluid, that's good. If you don't see the fluid, then you're going to start changing the settings. Problem here that if you are under gained with a probe that's too high of a frequency and your, your depth is wrong and your location is wrong, you might think that this is the diaphragm, you might think that this is a liver or a spleen, and that this is a proteinaceous fluid collection, while this is in reality the, the liver and this is the uh, the hepatorenal recess. So you're completely below the diaphragm at this point. So choosing the right settings on the machine is very important, and knowing your anatomy is also very important. So there is a dogma that says the sun should never set on a paranemonic effusion. It's been extrapolated into the sun should never set on a pleural effusion. So pleural effusion tap is very useful. And it gives you diagnostic information about 73% of the time. And it's useful in 92% of the time because you can use it also to rule out other diseases, for example, empyema. It might never give you the diagnosis, but it's going to tell you this is not what you're worried it would be. But once you start thinking about the risk-benefit balance, then you might start thinking twice about, should I tap this effusion when it's nighttime, when I don't have the right equipment, when the patient is a little bit restless, when they're on, on positive pressure, they can't sit upright. Because the usefulness is only in paranemonic effusions, not in any effusion. So this is an algorithm that you might want to use. If there is a pleural effusion, and this, I think, is on the handout, if there is a pleural effusion, then is the effusion big enough? Is it more than 10 millimeters thick on ultrasound or on decubitus radiograph? I would go a little bit farther than one centimeter and say one and a half centimeters would be kind of the safe, the safe size. And for someone who is, this is their first thoracentesis, maybe, maybe three would be a good number. Now, if this is not a big effusion, then just observe the patient. If it's a big effusion, does the patient have CHF? Because CHF is the cause of pleural effusions in about two-thirds of the time in the developed world. Two-thirds of pleural effusions are related to high pressure in the pulmonary venous system. If it is, and... The patient does not have, if, if the patient does not have uh, heart failure, then do the thoracentesis, but if the patient has heart failure, then is it symmetric and does the patient have chest pain or fever? If it's asymmetric, then maybe you can do the tap because 80% of CHF effusions are symmetric. But you still have 20% that might be bigger on one side or the other. But if the patient has chest pain related to the side of the effusion, or fever, or your suspicion of infection is very high, then you should probably do the, do the tap. If not, go for diuresis, and most CHF-related diffusions will resolve after two days of appropriate therapy for heart failure. So that can make you avoid a bunch of unnecessary procedures. But let's say your patient has, has this diffusion, and he comes in with dyspnea, CHF history, hypoxia, 40% FiO2, saturating 91%, admitted to the CCU for diuresis, 
And then you'll go after you see the patient and ask some more questions because that's what you learned. And the patient says they had fever, rigors, and night sweats. So you scramble, you find the senior, and you find the video. That's going to help you perform the procedure. This is the video in critical medicine from the medical medicine.
Once these are entered the fluoro phase, fluoro fluid will begin to fill the syringe. Inject more anesthetic at this point to anesthetize a highly sensitive varietal fluoro. Note the depth of penetration and then withdraw the needle. If available, a hemostat may be attached to the exposed portion of the needle to mark the depth of the fluoro phase. Attach an 18 gauge over the needle catheter to a syringe and advance it along the superior surface of the rib. Keep pulling back on the plunger as you proceed to predetermined depth of the fluid phase. Once fluid is aspirated, immediately stop advancing the needle and guide the plastic catheter over the needle. When the catheter is fully inserted, remove the needle as the patient exhales or hums. The exposed hub of the catheter should be covered immediately with your finger, preventing the entry of air into the plural space. Next, attach the three way stop valve and a large syringe to the catheter and continue to aspirate fluid. When this syringe is full, adjust the stop cock so that it closes the patient. The stop cock should be open to the patient only when fluid is being actively drained. If additional fluid needs to be drained for therapeutic purposes, attach the collection tube to the stop cock and to the evacuated container. Open the stop cock to the patient and to the tubing and allow the evacuated container to fill. Generally, you should remove no more than 1,500 milliliters of fluid fluid. The removal of larger volume may result in post-expansion pulmonary disease. On the completion of the fluid volume, you should rapidly remove the catheter as the patient holds the case of her breath at end of expiration. Cover the needle in the surgical site with an adhesive dressing and clean the surrounding skin. At the end of the procedure, make sure that all needles are placed into appropriate safety lines. Aspirated fluid should be placed in special tubes before the large aggregate container is filled for a while with its own. A tube without aggregate should be used for chemical analyses such as the measurement of lactate dehydrogenase, protein, and glucose levels. An EPA treated tube should be used as a cell count and differential count. Specimens for cytologic and microbiologic analyses and for other tests may be required depending on the clinical circumstances. These are discussed in further detail in the accompanying written comments. Analysis of plural fluid will help differentiate the transfer, which is commonly caused by a heart failure or cirrhosis, from an exudate, which may be caused by processes such as bacterial pneumonia, cancer, or trauma. Pneumothorax is uncommon after thorax diseases, and when present, is rarely required to place in the Test radiographs are not required after simple, uncomplicated procedures. Radiography of the chest should be performed if air was aspirated during the procedure, if chest pain, dyspnea, or hypoxemia develops, or if the patient is critically ill or undergoing an animal ventilation. Other complications of thoracic diseases include pain, coughing, and localized infection. More serious complications include hemothorax. Abdominal organ injury, air embolism, and post expansion pulmonary edema. So, you do the procedure and you drain no more than one and a half liters because the video said that. You avoid the abdominal organs and the patient doesn't cough during the procedure. But this happens. So you go back to the literature because you remember that you read this scary article from the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. It came out in 1988. Talked about 20% of people who get re-expansion pulmonary edema die. You go back to the room, you check on the patient, you go back to the room, you check on the patient multiple times, and you try to figure out what did I do that might have contributed to the re-expansion pulmonary edema. So, in that report, there were 53 cases that were reviewed for, for, for uh, re-expansion pulmonary edema, and 15 out of 47 had confirmed short duration of large effusion or a pneumothorax. Nevertheless, they developed 
pre expansion pulmonary edema. And the mortality was 11 out of 53. So you make sure you took only one and a half liters, and then you look at the literature one more time. You see that the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, about 10 years later, published an article looking at 185 consecutive thoracentesis where in 138, they drained between one and two liters. In 38 of the patients, they drained two to three liters. And in nine patients, they drained more than three. There were five cases of re-expansion pulmonary edema out of 185. And there was only one of the five where the patient had symptoms and nobody died. So you feel a little better. You scramble back to the literature and the guidelines, and you see that the ATS in 2000, the American Thoracic Society, said that the re-expansion pulmonary edema that you're seeing might not be really related to the level of negative intrapleural pressure. You didn't, use a, you didn't use a regulated suction, but you used your hand to pull all that fluid out, one and a half liters. So it was unregulated suction. And you were feeling bad about it, but you see this and you feel better. Maybe it, the causes are increased capillary permeability, vascular stretch, ischemia reperfusion injury to the expanded lung. And then you also find that the BTS, the British Thoracic Society, about 10 years after that, they said that you should stop and if, a drainage when there is no more fluid can be aspirated or you aspirate air, you stop. So, sorry, no more fluid or air can be aspirated. The patient develops cough during the procedure. The patient develops chest discomfort, or you have taken one and a half liters out already. So still, the limit of one and a half is still out there, although there is no particular evidence that says draining more than one and a half is, is, uh, is d detrimental to the patient. But it's nighttime, and you're on your own, and you don't want to do that. So you start talking to the senior. Should we have used a drainage suction kit? with regulated minus 20, no more negative than minus 20 suction, and would that have, maybe that would have reduced the, the chance of re-expansion pulmonary edema. The same British Thoracic Society article that came up with the latest guidelines, they suggest that if there is a pleural effusion that requires drainage, you decide, is this an emergency? If it's an emergency, you do the procedure regardless. But if it's not an emergency, then is it outside normal working hours? If it is, then does the patient have significant respiratory compromise? Now remember, your patient was 91% on 40% on oxygen, so they were kind of in trouble. In that case, you consider pleural aspiration to, re to relieve the symptoms and you delay draining everything else until appropriate expertise and supervision is available. Otherwise, there are some, some other options for you. And then the system that you're going to use, which is the dry suction vacutainer, uh, not vacutainer, I forgot the name of it, but it looks like this. There is a collection chamber here, a tube that goes to the patient, a tube that goes to the suction, a couple of release valves for emergencies. And this is your dial. If the dial says minus 20, it doesn't mean that there is any minus 20 until this bulb is inflated. Once you connect suction, this letter I, the suction control indicator window with fluorescent float, it's actually orange float, it fills up and now you know that the pressure that you set is actually the pressure that the patient is seeing. If the pressure becomes unreasonably high, there is a release valve, and if the patient coughs and the pressure goes too high inside the system, then there is another release valve. So you don't have to worry about the patient's side causing changes in pressure or the wall side causing changes in pressure. There is some evidence that you can even differentiate if an effusion is a normal effusion, uh, an effusion with a normal underlying lung where the curve goes from a little bit positive pressure when you start the procedure to a little bit negative when you end the procedure and it doesn't go lower than minus three or four 
even if you drain all of the fluid, versus if the pressure starts off positive and then it drops suddenly to low, much lower than you expect if, some, if somebody has an entrapped lung, where the lung needs more pressure to expand, more negative pressure to expand, versus someone who has trapped lung and this fluid buildup is not, is, is, is not related to extraneous factors, but it's really related to the, the lung, diseased lung causing vacuum in the pleural space. This is where as soon as you stick in the needle, air goes in and you think you caused the pneumothorax, where in reality you didn't, there has always been negative pressure that's looking for an opportunity to fill up with anything. If there is no air, it fills up with water. Now you have the sample. What do you do with it? If you send it for everything, you know statistically you're going to have a chance of 1 in 20 of having a false positive. So you want to be systematic. You decide you're going to send only what's necessary to differentiate between a transudate and an exudate using Light's criteria. Light worked on his criteria in 1970, and they're still the best things that we have. So you send for protein, LDH, and you send for serum protein and serum LDH. And you try to figure out, is this an exudate or a transudate? Like I said, this is really the most important first step. If you don't have an exudate and you have a transudate, then your patient is one of the third of the patients who are going to present with pleural effusion where the underlying disease is, is heart failure. So you don't have to do more than treat the underlying cause. Light didn't only look at those criteria, looked at other things too. The protein uh, level that, uh, that distinguishes an exudate from a transudate. So these are all exudates here. An albumin gradient similar to the SAG that you use for paracentesis. This is called the SPAG, the serum plural uh, albumin gradient. And there's also cholesterol gradient and an absolute cholesterol value that help distinguish between um, exudate and transudate. So after light and after the meta-analysis that happened in 97 that confirmed light's criteria to be the best test that we have, Joseph and, and others came out with the criteria that looked at the, um, the area under the, 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 the operator receiving curve to figure out what test was really the best test, single best test, to distinguish exudate from transudate. And I'm really pushing on this point because this is what you're going to have to decide on in a third of the cases of paracentesis that you're going to perform, uh, thoracentesis that you're going to perform. And what Joseph found was that an absolute LDH value, rather than using two-thirds of the serum upper limit of normal, using an absolute value of 163, gave the best area under the curve for diagnostic purposes. And if you're not sure of the area under the curve, the higher the number closer to one, the more sensitive and specific the test is. If you have an area under the receiver operating curve of 0.5, that means this test is useless in distinguishing uh, between two things. So uh, a plural LDH absolute value of 163 was the best test, as good as, almost as good as, a P2F um, uh, plural fluid to serum LDH over 200, and even a little better than protein and, and, and uh, LDH ratio. So, you send the sample for what you think it is, congestive heart failure, and trying to figure out is this a transudate or an exudate, and you hope it's none of the other cases below, because in all of the, these cases, the test is going to be useful, except in really just pulmonary embolism where it could be a transudate, it could be an exudate. But in the most common causes of, of uh, pleural effusion, the transudate-exudate distinction is going to be helpful. So you do the thoracentesis, you're trying to get the ratios, and it will help you distinguish unless you're facing one of these diagnostic dilemmas of empyema malignancy or tuberculosis, pleurisy, where definitive tests can help you distinguish or diagnose the disease 
hemothorax can easily be diagnosed if you have a ratio uh, of uh, pleural fluid to uh, uh, pleural fluid creat uh, hematocrit of more than 20. Urinothorax is, is a funny one. If uh, the pleural fluid smells like urine, then it's a urinothorax. Otherwise, you can test the glucose and the pH, and usually they're very low. For peritoneal diet, dialysis, you usually have very high glucose because there is very high glucose in the peritoneal fluid. Esophageal rupture, you can, you can diagnose by very low pH and very high um, amylase. Rheumatoid pleurisy, usually a diagnosis that's clinically made, but there are um, tests that you can send in the pleural fluid as just like rheumatoid factor. And catheter migration, whether fluid comes out has the characteristics of the fluid going in the catheter. Uh, all of these numbers are on your cheat sheet. There is a small font on the first page, lower half, that distinguishes all of these diagnoses and what tests are needed for them. So, you have the 70-year-old man who comes in with 80-pack year history of smoking, history of congestive heart failure, increasing, increasing shortness of breath, chest pain worsens with inspiration, and small hemoptysis, but the patient is afebrile. And then after you start diuresis, you get the x-ray, which confirms pulmonary congestion. You see this, and you ask the patient, what is this? He says, I don't know. I have a port of some sort. What happened here? I broke my arm a while ago. Poor historian, you know. And... You start diuresis, and then you realize that the patient is complaining, has complained of weight loss and poor appetite, has distended neck veins also, has an S3 gallop, confirms this history of CHF, lower extremity edema, of course. Cardiac enzymes are negative, and on telemetry, the patient is in sinus rhythm with requires a little bit of oxygen and develops a fever. So... Let's assume this is the same patient that you had before. Do you use an ultrasound during the tap? That's one, one question. Do you do a diagnostic only if the patient is not on a lot of oxygen? And do you get an x-ray after, after the fact? So those are the most commonly asked three questions for someone who's just starting to do this procedure. So the answers are actually uh, not straightforward because those three things are connected. Uh, if you're going to use uh, an ultrasound guidance, then really the operator's dexterity is more important than the presence of the device of the ultrasound or not. The, the getting an x-ray after the procedure also depends on the operator's skill level rather than any of these findings. And um, are you going to do diagnostic or therapeutic? It depends on how much support you have. Are you willing to deal with complications of re-expansion pulmonary edema during the night or not if you drain too much or you generate too much negative pressure, although it's never been clear that this is, this is the usual cause of re-expansion pulmonary edema. So you do the tap, let's say, and the suggestion is that you do the tap and you look for those things. And the patient's, uh, and, and the person, you're doing the tap, you get no air, you aspirate no air, you aspirate only fluid, the procedure goes smoothly, the patient has no cough during the procedure, no chest pain after the procedure or during the procedure, and the patient has no more tactile parameters on the side, side of the tap. So do you get a chest x-ray? Show of hands, yes. Show of hands, maybe not yet. Okay. So I, I, I noticed that once I said tactile parameters, a lot of people squinted. So tactile parameters tells you there is lung. And if you don't have tactile parameters, that means there is no lung. There is air in there. Okay. So you do get an extra. If there was a case series, actually, of all thoracentesis that were done, on um, how many patients? Let's see. Uh, 508 cases. And if the patient didn't have any of these, 
no air, no cough, no chest pain, but also had tactile parameters after the procedure on the side of the tap, only four people out of 488 were found to have a pneumothorax. But if somebody had one of these things, either aspirating air, cough during the procedure, chest pain during the procedure or after, or loss of tactile parameters, 13 out of the 18 had pneumothoraces. So it's a good starting point to look at these things and consider those things while you're doing the procedure to decide. But like I said, if it's your second thoracentesis, you're probably going to get an x-ray anyway. But if you hear that an x-ray is not absolutely necessary, it's true. It's not absolutely necessary. The fluid you get is kind of this color. It's supposed to be a little more red. Red, in red enough to scare you. And you say, did I go above the rib or below the rib? What was I supposed to do? I forgot what the video showed. Did I hit the artery? Or is this related to something else? Is it really a hemothorax unrelated to the procedure? So you can send the fluid for what? Hematocrit. Yes, hematocrit. Okay. And if the number is less than 1%, then it's not significant. If it's more than 50 then you definitely hit the artery. If it's between 1 and 20, then it could be anything else. And of course, the result comes back between 1 and 20. The patient says, no more sticks. I'm not going to give you serum. You can't check any ratio between the pleural fluid and the serum. But you have these numbers. You have a white cell count of 2,000, mostly lymphocytes, a lot of red cells, 100,000, and a pH that's on the low side, and you start to worry. So you have a pleural fluid LDH of 410, and you know from your lab that the, lower, the upper limit of normal serum is uh, 220. Is the high LDH related to the red cells that are in the fluid, or is it not related to the red cells in the fluid? The, late, the patient is three liters of negative diuresis in the meanwhile, and you find an equation in your cheat sheet that tells you how to correct for RBCs. And with the correction, the LDH turns out to be 290, so it's still significant. Now you're convinced this is not a transidate. This is an exudate, so you have to do more work. But again, the patient is three liters negative by the time of the tab. Is there such a thing as diuresing a transidate to an exudate? I've heard of that multiple times. There is a test called NT Pro BNP. It's a little more expensive than BNP. And this was a case series of how many? Uh, 118 patients, 181 patients. Some of them had CHF, some of them had other diagnoses, and they measured the pleural fluid NT pro BNP. And they found that, that a cutoff value of 1,500 was really good in distinguishing between CHF-related or heart failure-related versus any other cause with an area under the curve of 0.93. This is really good. It's almost as good as the SPAG. So the serum pleural albumin gradient of more than 1.2. So still a very extensive test for something that we can easily do. You do it, and you find out that, no, the SPAG is actually less than 1.1. Now you have a lymphocytic exudate with a low pH. And you have a host of differentials, including causes of low pH, like empyema, parenomonic effusion, rheumatoids, fluoresce, esophageal rupture, malignancy, TB, or lupus, or lymphocytic exudate causes, post-gabbage, chloracy, TB, chylothorax, lymphoma, yellow-nail syndrome, and others. Things that really include both are the ones that are highlighted, and the most common ones are malignancy and TB chloracy. Actually, those two account for 90% of the cases of lymphocytic low pH effusions. So you decide 
I'm going to send RF and ANA because it's easy. I'm going to send for cytology because I'm worried about malignancy. And I'm going to send for an AFB. And you call the lab, you find your friend there, and she says, there are no AFBs in there. You say, nevertheless, I'm going to isolate the patient, put a PPD on, get flow cytometry on the fluid to see if this is lymphoma, because the cytology is negative, but they didn't do, they didn't do flow cytometry, and let's do a CT. Oh, yeah, make that a spiral CT. There is a better test, a faster test for TB, rather than waiting for the isolation and the, um, and the uh, PPD test and the IGR, the uh, uh, IG um, interferon gamma. Uh, you can actually send a, an adenosine deaminase on the fluid. And in this, in this situation, there were 400, there were 240 and 54 patients who had TB and 253 of them, so all of them except one, had an adenosine deaminase of more than 40. And in other cases, you still have a couple of people with a high adenosine deaminase, but mostly it's going to be less than 40. And you hope the number is going to be less than 40. 20, good. Get the patient out of isolation because the CT scanner won't do the CT unless the patient is out of isolation. And you get the CT. They call you. They say, there could be a mass. We're not sure what's underlying the effusion. There could be rheumatoid nodules. And there is still a large effusion on the side of the tap, but there is a PE also. So you call the pulmonary consult. Pulmonary consult say, good job ruling out TB. Good job ruling out empyema. Oh, yes, start anticoagulation. That's the only thing they're going to say. In the meanwhile, rheumatoid factor and ANA comes back positive. You call the pulmonary consult to say, what is this? And they say, oh, we forgot about the effusion already. You have a diagnosis. So you look up the literature. And it so happens that ANA is positive in in, it's, it's false positive in about 10% of people who have a lymphocytic effusion, and it's not related to any rheumatologic disease. The diagnosis of uh, rheumatoid uh, uh, pleural effusion is related to clinical manifestations, not serologic testing. You expect the resolution of the fluid with time. With PE, it takes about four months. For, sorry, three, four weeks for it to go away. With TB, if it was, it takes about four months, and with other diseases, it might take longer. For example, if it's asbestos-related, benign asbestosis-related effusion, it takes about six months, and then it, the fluid goes away. If it's yellowness syndrome, it might never go away. It depends on the exposure that's causing the effusion. In about 15% of the cases, you never find a reason. Even with the most invasive tests and with uh, even uh, pleural biopsies and VATs, you still don't have a diagnosis of, um, of exudates. Transudates, you know almost always what's the cause. All right, just five slides of quick quizzes. Here's a patient with renal failure, small right-sided diffusion who suddenly decompensates and the effusion gets much bigger. You tap it, it's a transudate with very low protein. Do you want a hint? The glucose is 300 to 400. So like I said, peritoneal dialysis fluid has a lot of glucose. That's what it is. Okay. So, People do get hernias, and they do get perforations within the diaphragm, and fluid can migrate up, or the catheter can migrate through the diaphragm, which is a problem. Okay, motor vehicle accident, multiple ribs fractured, and one year later presents with chest pain and right effusion, filling half of the chest. No other abnormality in the parenchyma, 
you get one and a half liters out. It's lymphocytic transudate, transudate, not an exudate, with a good pH and a serum level with a glucose level similar to the serum, not lower than that. Next morning, the fluid is back to the same prior level. And you say, good, another procedure. <coughs> no, you don't do another procedure because this is trapped lung. The fluid doesn't fill up that fast. In someone who has normal parenchyma, no, uh, no damage to the alveolar capillaries should not fill up that fast unless there is vacuum. An alcoholic presents with shortness of breath, elevated left hemidiaphragm, hemorrhagic turbid fluid. That smells bad. Neutrophilic predominant with a good pH and a good glucose. Because if this was in Paim, I expect it to be neutrophilic with bad pH and low glucose, but it's not. A hint. The amylase is more than 100,000. If it was ruptured esophagus, it's going to have a very low pH. This is pancreatic disease-related pleural effusion. So pancreatitis. Okay. Left-sided chest pain. Just like the heart attack I had, Doc, that I had six months ago. So you rule out MI. The patient has fever, dyspnea, leukocytosis, left effusion, serosanguinous with neutrophilia, neutrophils. It's not in pyema because the glucose and the pH are normal. And you send one more test called the AMA. What's that? Anti-myocyte antibody. Okay, so this is uh, post cardiac injury syndrome. So it's an autoimmune disease that affects the pleural surface as well as the pericardial surface, and the patient can present with pleural or pericardial effusion, also known as somebody's name. Dresslers, thank you. Very good. Finally, an HIV patient with a gradual onset of dyspnea. Large left effusion, protein 5, lymphocytes mostly, and it's good pH and good glucose. Kicker here, the color of the fluid. What is this? If you say it's a chylothorax, I would say yes, but what's the confirmatory test? Is it... Medium chain one. Oh yeah, you feed the patient medium chain fat and the fluid goes away. Can you can you test can you test this for something else? Find that. So is it a um, is it a uh, chylomicron test? Is it a cholesterol test? Or is it the right test? That's in your handouts. Figure it out. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> 